sit right there, it'd be fine, right? Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jack Daly, director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, and it's my honor to welcome you to the uh, latest in the series of General Electric Aviation Lectures. Established in 1982, the GE series is the museum's longest running program supported by a single sponsor. Representing General Electric Aviation in the audience tonight is Peter Prowitt, Executive Director, Global Government Relations. Peter, would you stand and be recognized, please? How about a hand, ladies and gentlemen? None of these programs would be possible without this sponsorship, so we are indebted to you for, uh, for making this possible. Thank you very much. We began the year with a new exhibition, Fly Marines, the Centennial of Marine Corps Aviation, 1912 to 2012. Throughout the year, we have recognized the theme of marine aviation in many of our programs, such as family days and events and other activities. Tonight's program also supports this theme. A number of individuals have paved the way as Marine Corps leaders. Marines are known as the few and proud, ready to take on any mission. None, however, face the immense challenges that our speaker did when he joined the US Navy in 1950 and later applied for a Marine Corps commission. After you hear about his life and career tonight, you will understand why Lieutenant General Frank Peterson is a true pioneer in every sense of the word. After enlisting in 1950, General Peterson entered the Naval Aviation Cadet Program the following year. He completed flight training in 1952 and became the first African American in the history of the Marine Corps to be commissioned as a second lieutenant. Throughout his career, he's flown many different aircraft, including the Corsair, and that's the F-4U Corsair, uh, the Hellcat, Bearcat, Sky Raider, F-4B, F-15, F-16, F-18, and Harrier. So he, uh, he knows his way around the cockpit. General Peterson flew more than 350 combat missions while serving in both the Korean War and Vietnam. In 1968, he commanded Marine Fighter Squadron 314, the Black Knights which was the most highly decorated Marine fighter squadron in, in Vietnam. On his 65th mission, he was shot down by enemy aircraft fire, and he successfully objected and went on to fly an additional 200 missions. Maybe he'll fill us in on the in-between ejection and the next 200. In 1978, General Peterson became the first African-American general in the Marine Corps when he was promoted to the rank of brigadier. In 1983, he was promoted to major general and then in 1986 to Lieutenant General. He continued to be the only African American General in the Corps until his retirement in 1988. Lieutenant General Peterson commanded at every echelon of aviation from fighter squadron to marine aircraft wing. From 1985 to 1988, he held the title as Silver Hawk and Gray Eagle as the individual with the most mature date of designation as a Naval Aviator. Do you get that, folks? That's the oldest guy around. The, uh, the Gray Eagle is the Navy um, most senior aviator in terms of date of designation. The Silver Hawk is the Marine Corps uh, uh, trophy for that. So he held both of those, and, uh, and, but it's a very distinguished uh, award because only one guy can get it at a time. And if, in his case, he wiped it out for three or four other people because he had it for several years. So he's dearly beloved by everyone. The, uh, he, um, his final uh, military assignment was as commander of the Marine Corps Combat and Development Command in Quantico, Virginia, which is where they determine all of the requirements for tactics, strategies, and, and equipment uh, to, to pursue uh, combat in the future. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lieutenant General Frank Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Okay, Thank you, Jack. After uh, hearing that introduction, I wonder who the hell Jack was talking about. <laughs> what I propose to do is uh, first deal with some of the history associated with, um, with my career. And at the conclusion of my presentation, I will be open to uh, questions uh, that you may have. But first, let me fill in historically some of the background in terms of uh, blacks in the military. In uh, World War II, uh, blacks flew fighter aircraft with the 99th Pursuit Squadron. 
until <clears throat> the president took action. No blacks were allowed to serve in the Marine Corps, but that was in the 19, oh, about the 43 era. And at that point in time, blacks were then <clears throat> admitted into the Marine Corps, serving at uh, Monfort Point, North Carolina. Then <clears throat> in the 1948 era, uh, President Truman issued an edict that uh, required all the services uh, to integrate. In other words, an end of segregated uh, units. That then led to the absolutely lead up to the Korean War. At the start of the Korean War, there were still all black units serving, but they were commanded still by white officers. But that then led the way to a realization <clears throat> that blacks were really qualified to serve in all aspects. In 1950, when I joined the service, I was in boot camp, San Diego, and that was the start of the Korean War. At that point, the Marine Corps and the Navy were flying combat missions, some off carriers, some off ground bases uh, in Korea. One of those missions was flown by a black naval aviator named uh, Jesse Brown. Jesse was shot down in Korea, he was flying Corsairs, and uh, was trapped in the cockpit. Uh, he could not ext ext extricate himself. As a result, <clears throat> one of Jesse's wingmen crash landed his Corsair uh, beside Jesse to try and re release him from the cockpit, but he was unsuccessful. Jesse died in the cockpit. Jesse's wingman was a guy named Thomas Hudner. And quite frankly, there was some indecision in terms of what would happen to uh, Tom, whether give him a court martial or a Medal of Honor. And Hudner wound up with a Medal of Honor. That made, that made press throughout, throughout the world and especially uh, throughout America. Highly publicized event. And Jesse was, of course, publicized as being the first back, I'm sorry, the first black naval aviator. And we all believed that to be true until, oh, about 10 years ago, and I'll remark on that further. When I heard that uh, blacks were flying in the Navy, I began to take a look at whether or not I could apply for that particular program. I met the qualifications and <clears throat> put my name in, and shortly thereafter, wound up starting my training uh, down in Pensacola, Florida. At the point where I entered the training, there had only been three blacks to go through flight school. Uh, Jesse Brown, a guy named Earl Carter, and a guy named Floyd. And of course, Jesse died in, in, in the Korea. And I was the fourth to enter the program and the fourth to complete the program. It was a very interesting period as we went through our flight school uh, training. It was held in Pensacola, Florida. And of course, in those days, there was quite a bit of uh, racial segregation, uh, not on board base, but off base. And it was interesting in that as a cadet, traveling from the base to the town using public transportation, on base, I could sit wherever I wished to on the bus. But as soon as you hit the main gate, you had to then move to segregated seating, which was uh, something of a difficulty in the sense that all of my buddies, the guys that I was training with, uh, we never were able to go on liberty together. We were never able to uh, travel in town together. Also, <clears throat> the conditions were such that we trained at about four different bases in the Pensacola and uh, Corpus Christi area. And the <clears throat> type of aircraft that we flew, we started out flying the SNJ, which is a two-seat trainer. Once we completed that basic training, 
we immediately moved to an airplane called the F-8F Bearcat. And that's like going from a Model A to a Jaguar sports car. The, the SNJ was a relatively tame aircraft, but when we jumped into the F-8F Bearcat, it was hold on and hold on tight because that was one of the fastest fighter uh, prop aircraft in the world and still holds several world speed records for propeller-driven aircraft. We knew that our final training would be taking that aircraft aboard carriers to qualify. And none of us were really eager to, to try that. We all knew that uh, the, uh, thanks Jack. We all knew that uh, the aircraft had a very, very high torque rate. In other words, if you release the brakes and applied full power, the aircraft would swerve to the left of the runway. You couldn't hold it on. So what we learned to do was to add power slowly until we re reached a sufficient ground speed where the rudder would become effective. And from there, we could then go ahead and make a uh, straight ahead takeoff. But it was quite a handful. Also, as we did our training, we could look over at the field where the carrier landing practices were being held and it was barren field and about once a week we'd see a puff of black smoke rising and we knew another cadet had bit the dust so none of us were really eager to participate because we knew that this aircraft would bite you especially in the carrier landing practice about one month before we were to begin our carrier uh, training, a wise guy said, hey, the F-8F is too much of an aircraft for cadets. Let's move them to the F-6F, Hellcat. So during my cadet period, <clears throat> I flew the SNJ, I flew the F-8F Bearcat, and then I flew the F-6F Hellcat. One of the interesting things we used to do was uh, when we were running out of Corpus Christi, we would fly <clears throat> low-level training missions in the F-8F. And uh, the trick was to see how low you could get because your prop wash would then leave a spray behind you the same as if you are in a motorboat. And I, I can remember on one occasion, I was on this guy's wing <clears throat> and we kept going lower, lower, lower. I finally said, I'm not gonna go any lower. And I looked <clears throat> at my wingman had gone that last foot, he had dinged the prop, the prop, of course, spun forward, and he had to crash land in the water. Our instructor said, okay, he would stay and form the rescue, and for the rest of us to head back to the field. I made it a point to land last. I knew there would be questions, and I didn't want to answer them. <laughs> My fellow pilot survived, and we were very close in that group in the sense of, let's hold it within the group. And uh, if they can get the airplane out of the water, they'll have to prove that it wasn't really a power failure, so we'll just hold fast and let's see what happens. That was one of the more interesting experiences uh, as I went through. But always there was the uh, issue of, okay, uh, <clears throat> where are we going to go? Where are we going to fly? and where are we going to practice? And I'll never forget in my early training, one of the uh, flights that we took was to travel to a grass field, land, ref refuel, have lunch, climb back in the aircraft, and uh, return to base. Well, we landed at the grass field, and it was just a, oh, about 500 foot, no, I'm sorry, a 5,000 foot runway with an old grass shack at the end of the runway that served hamburgers and, and uh, some other fast food. So we walked in to have lunch and the owner said, I'm sorry, that boy can't eat here. He had to eat on the porch. I said, okay, here we go again. So <clears throat> my buddies went in, bought hamburgers and we all sat on the front porch and uh, began to plan for the return flight. I said, you know, I've about had enough. So I asked my instructor if I could take off last. 
and the runway was directly in front of this, this hut. I said, sure. I mean, the instructor said, sure, go ahead, Frank. I don't know if you knew what I had planned, but at any rate, as the last airplane to depart, I swung my tail directly at the front door of that shack, went to full power, held the brakes, and I looked in the rear view mirror, the door was flapping back and forth, hound dogs were running under the, the front porch, <clears throat> and a big cloud of dust. I released the brakes and said, engine, don't fail me now. <laughs> So that was just one of the more interesting uh, experiences that from there on it, uh, it was pretty smooth sailing. I say smooth in the sense of we had completed most of the training. Uh, it was difficult, but then it was time to make a decision as to whether you were going to go into the uh, Marine Corps or the Navy. And I, of course, had opted to go into the Marine Corps. They sent my papers into headquarters, and <clears throat> they <clears throat> indicated that I was Caucasian. Uh, when they finally figured it out, they sent a message to headquarters Marine Corps saying, in essence, we have made a, a mistake, and headquarters came back in essence saying, well, we have to start sometime, let's start now. So that's when I became <clears throat> a brand spanking second lieutenant United States Marine Corps. My first set of orders were to Cherry Point, North Carolina. And I said, oh no, 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 <laughs> oh no, no. I requested a modification to those orders and they were changed to uh, Marine Corps Station, El Toro, California. What I didn't realize by asking for that modification or change to my duty station, I had placed myself in the queue for combat training going to Korea. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, Frank, you're so smart, you went out from the frying pan into the fire. So at any rate, we conducted quite a bit of our training there at uh, El Toro and uh, went overseas in uh, April of 1953. I just turned 21 years of age. On arrival in uh, Korea, the squadron was composed of a large majority of reserve pilots who had been called back to active duty. Uh, by virtue of the Truman Edict. And these were guys who had fought in World War II, had left the service, had gone into many lines of business, uh, had learned to be civilians once again. And they were not too happy a crowd to come back into active duty. They were a great bunch of guys. I, as a brand spanking second lieutenant, made it a point to listen very carefully and to really observe how these guys conducted themselves. I said, these guys have been to war before. Uh, they know the way that it's done. We were then flying the Corsair and our base was located at uh, a, a place called Pyeongtaek, which is about 30 miles to the south of Seoul. So from our base at Pyeongtaek, we would fly missions all the way up to the Yalu River, which is a river separating China and uh, North Korea, and we were flying for the most part close air support missions, sometimes as many missions as two or three a day. We were <clears throat> quite a bit involved in close air support. Sometimes our targets would be nothing other than an ox-drawn cart. Why? Primitive mode of transportation and the battle lines were fairly stagnant. So anything we caught moving north of the DMZ, DMZ being the demilitarized zone, uh, was fair game. That also made us fair game. We would fly missions up along the Yalu and we would be escorted by F-86 uh, Air Force fighters. And I long held the belief that we were the bait to lure the bad guys down across the border from China to allow the F-86s to get a shot at them. And on more than one occasion, I would see a Corsair in a dive. I would see a bad guy MiG behind the Corsair, an F-86 behind the MiG, and it was like, uh, here, here goes a rabbit, Let, let's all jump on board this one. On one of those missions up north, uh, we were just returning, oh, we'd been up close to the Yalu, and suddenly we were jumped by two MiGs. Uh, chaos, yes. 
uh, our squadron commander uh, instructed us to form a Luffberry circle. And I said to myself, what in the hell is a Luffberry circle? <laughs> it was a tactic used in World War II where if you were attacked, the <coughs> aircraft would form a circle allowing the, one of the airplanes to have a shot at the attacking aircraft. So when we returned home, I, uh, I asked the skipper, I said, what, what, what's a Lovebury Circle? And he began to explain it, and I thought, you know, war is still pretty much the same. Uh, the further you get ahead, uh, you, you still rely on some of those things that you learned as a, as a young and coming up. But at any rate, <clears throat> I flew some 60 uh, missions uh, in Korea, and of course I was something of a phenomenon in the sense that there were no other black pilots uh, in the Marine Corps. I had a chance to meet quite a few of uh, big names in the Marine Corps. Uh, John Glenn, he was flying then F-9Fs. A guy named Jerry Coleman, who was flying F-9Fs out of the airfield K-3, which was down south of where we were located. <clears throat> I never felt that <clears throat> The, uh, the going was too tough, but what I never got used to was the uncertainty of who was going to get hit, who was going to come back, but we always felt big sky, little bullet, I will never get hit, and that proved to be true at least for that war. I can remember on the last day of the truce, many people don't realize that the United States and Korea are still technically I'm sorry, the United States and North Korea are still technically at war. That war was finished by virtue of a truce, both sides saying we're going to stop shooting. So technically, there's still war with, or we're still at war with North Korea. Anyway, on the, the day the truce was announced, we were taxiing out for a mission. I say we, I was a wingman. And my leader was a captain, reservist called back in. And the plan was, <coughs> The truce was effective at 12 o'clock on that day. We were to get one last mission in and, and finish it up. We got to the end of the runway, and I looked at my leader, and his prop was slowing down. He shut the engine off. I said, what the hell is this? He set the brakes, climbed over the side of the airplane, saluted the runway, and walked away. I got back to the uh, flight line. I said, Ed, what was that all about? He said, you just saw me fly my last mission. I said, I said okay, I understand. <laughs> I understand. Returning to the United States, I flew several different kind of uh, fighter aircraft, jets, and I was amazed at my first flight in uh, a jet aircraft. That was a T-33. It was very, very quiet. The noise was behind you, and there was no big engine in front. And I knew then that I had fallen in love with, uh, with jet aircraft. And I went on to fly, oh, I guess some 10 or 15 different types of, uh, of jet aircraft. But at the same time, we were always in a, a training category. We never knew when the whistle would blow, when we were going to be called upon to uh, go back into combat. But it was a very wonderful experience. And <clears throat> Quite often, we would uh, fly cross countries uh, just to gain the flight time and to gain the experience uh, in the aircraft. I can remember <coughs> flying, uh, I was coming back from the East Coast, ran into a heavy uh, headwind, and I had to land, this was in the early, mid-1950s, at Little Rock Air Force Base. And <coughs> I landed, my Rear seater and I walked in, and this was at a time when there were race riots taking place, and there was a lot of uh, civilian turmoil, especially in Little Rock. We walked into the terminal, <coughs> and the captain on duty turned to my rear seater, who was white, and said, "How much gas do you want?" And the rear seater said, "Ask him. He's the pilot." And the guy looked at me and said. Oh, Lord, they got their own Air Force now. <laughs> so I had many of those interesting experiences 
uh, as I flew uh, through these various types of aircraft. But the real kicker came <clears throat> with the uh, start of the Vietnam War. Uh, Korea was a pretty stagnant kind of war in that you get a good night's sleep. We did have a guy who would fly over occasionally and toss hand grenades out at random, but uh, it was pretty stable. The Vietnam was totally different. I arrived in Vietnam. As we climbed off the transport airplane, I looked over in the distance, and there was a C-130 aircraft on fire. They had just undergone a rocket attack. And I knew right then and there, this is going to be a totally different kind of war. When we got to uh, the uh, barracks, I uh, met quite a few of my old buddies. And we were sitting there talking and chatting. It was after dinner, trying to get caught up. And I was trying to learn as much as I could. When all of a sudden, one of the guys said, that's a mortar. And I thought, a mortar? I looked around, and everyone had disappeared. I said, okay, I know where the bomb shelter is, so I ran there, and after about an hour or so, they all clear sounded, and we regrouped, and I said, how do you guys know that was a mortar? I said, Frank, after you've been here for a while, you can hear the click <laughs> as it leaves the tube. I said, okay. I said, well, where did you guys go? What they had done, individually, they welded together two 50-gallon drums, dug a hole, buried the drum in there, and made a tin covering, or metal covering, and what they would do is run out the door and jump in this hole and pull the cover over and hunker down until the attack stopped. And I said, okay, how do, you get, how, how do you get to build one of these? They said, Frank, you get a shovel and you dig your own hole. I said, okay, I got gotcha. you. But it was a very interesting period. Uh, quite often, uh, once we got into the swing of things, uh, we would fly maybe two, three missions a day. And we were going all the way up to Hanoi on some of these missions, but for the most part, we were doing uh, close air support. At the same time, there was a great deal of unrest on the ground troops in the troops period in Vietnam. There was a war within a war. There was racial friction, there were race riots, not just confined to Vietnam, but also in the United States. They spread to the entire spectrum of military. On one occasion, there was a Navy aircraft carrier on duty off the coast of uh, North Vietnam. A race riot broke out aboard ship, and the ship had to be pulled off station and returned to Subic Bay in the Philippines. Um, that was just one of the incidents. In the United States, there were several race riots aboard military bases, both Navy, I'm sorry, Marine Corps, and Army. And it was obvious that it was time to take a hard look at these issues and come to some form of solution to ensure that the military forces would maintain their fighting capability. Quite often, units would go into combat and uh, they would have incidents such as fragging. Fragging is when a disgruntled trooper would take a hand grenade and throw it in a tent to sort of get even. In fact, one of their sayings was, payback is a medevac. And they literally meant it. It became so severe <clears throat> that the Marine Corps began to uh, take a hard look at the causes of the problem, the lack of education, of these particular issues and how to go about resolving them. Uh, <clears throat> they sent emissaries around to the various bases to sit and try and learn just what was causing these friction. And quite frankly, it was very simple at that. In those days, there was the, the draft. And the draft meant, in essence, that uh, many judges would clean the streets by telling the bad guys, go to the service or go to jail. And of course, they chose the service. And then you'd have these young, uneducated kids being commanded by sharp young lieutenants, all with college degrees, and a whole lack of misunderstanding in terms of just not conversation, but lifestyle and what one wanted and the other 
could not understand. I recall one incident where a friend of mine, a black lieutenant who was a JAG officer, Judge Advocate General Officer, a lawyer, he and his white counterpart went to the brig to interview one of these kids and uh, the kid began to talk and I'll just use some of his vernacular. Well, when the motherfucker tried to mess over me, I had to go out and do a job on him. And the white officer said, what did you say? And my friend said, don't worry, I understand him. So this patois, the uh, lack of understanding caused quite a few difficulties. But eventually it settled down and uh, people began to understand that there are differences, but at the same time, once you wear the uniform, you all must work together. Another interesting incident, while I was a squadron commander, I uh, was sitting in my tent one day, and I heard my sergeant major say, hold on there, trooper, you can't go in there. That's the skipper's quarters. And I hear this voice say, yes, sergeant major, but I think he's the one I'm looking for. Turned out this young black corporal had been up on the line and uh, was being sent a court-martial for something that had taken place in his battalion. So I said to my sergeant major, that's okay, sergeant major, send him in, I'll talk to him. So the kid came in, I said, Corporal, you want a cup of coffee? Tell me what's bothering you. He said, well, son, I guess it all started when I shot the lieutenant. I said, oh, oh. <laughs> sergeant major, you better get in there. It turned out it was an accidental discharge and uh, they were going to run him up. But after talking with the commanding officer and explaining a little bit of the situation as I saw it, then they sort of relaxed a little bit and they busted him, but they didn't put him in the, in the, in, in, in the, in the brig. Many of the missions we flew were very, very exciting. I think General Daly indicated on my mission number 65, I believe it was, we were running up uh, just above the uh, the demilitarized zone up into uh, North Vietnam. A Marine rifle company had been jumped and uh, they needed bailing out. So we flew up and uh, identified the target, the forward air controller, uh, marked the target for us. And we rolled in and we were dropping uh, thousand pound bombs. On my second pass as I pulled the nose up above the horizon, I felt a large thud on the left side of the aircraft and I knew we had taken a hit. I say we because my rear seater, uh, we were in tandem seats and he was right behind me and I thought at first that he perhaps could have been uh, hit. So I said, Ed, you okay? He said, yes, Skipper. I said, well, we just took a hit and I think we better red, uh, run for the water, which was our standard procedure. Uh, rather than bail out or eject over, over north or south of Vietnam, the plan was to run out over the water, punch, and hopefully get picked up by choppers. My rear seat said, Skipper, we're very close to the DMZ. Let's run south and try and get close to a marine base in case we have to punch out. And I said, okay, Ed, let's go for it. About halfway back, the left engine caught, <coughs> I'm sorry, the left engine caught fire. So I said, oh boy, shut the left engine down, it went to more power on the right engine, and we were okay for about two minutes, and then suddenly a fire warning light on the right engine came on. The left engine had potted, blown itself apart, and the debris had then contaminated uh, the other engine. So we we're running pretty much out of options, but I restarted the left engine figuring that, well, they're gonna blow, they're gonna blow, but let's get out of here as fast as we can. And shortly thereafter, <clears throat> I saw my hydraulic pressure going to zero. And I don't care what kind of airplane you're in, these modern aircraft, without hydraulic pressure, you have no control over the airplane. So I said, okay. I said, Ed, <clears throat> the controls froze, I couldn't move the stick. I said, Ed, it's time to go, this punch. <laughs> my rear seat said, Skipper, I really hate to do this. I said, Ed, in about five seconds, you're gonna be talking to yourself. <laughs> Cause I'm out of here. <laughs> so we punched, and as I waited for the miracles to happen, the miracle being the seat worked, the parachute worked, 
the parachute opened and everything worked. I thought, Whew, wow. Then I looked down, I was about 5,000 feet and I could see guys running towards my uh, landing point. And I thought, oh Lord, here we go again. So <clears throat> about that same time, I looked over in the other direction and there was a CH-46 coming in. Uh, now we had emergency radio beepers that we carried and on activating it, no matter where you were in north or south of Vietnam, it would send a signal allowing people to know, one, you're in distress and that uh, they could find you. So I activated the radio, <coughs> the radar beacon, and uh, I looked, and here it was a CH-46 coming in in response to the beacon code, and it had a 50 cal in the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in the window. So I thought, okay, when I landed, I got out of the chute, I ran and jumped over a rice paddy in about two feet of mud and just hunkered down. And I said, <clears throat> if these are really bad guys, I'll let them talk to that 50 cal. <clears throat> and we'll see then if it's okay for me to get up and run. So I looked, <clears throat> <clears throat> waited for a few seconds, and there I saw the, uh, the door gunner start to get out of the 46 and run towards me. I guess he thought that I was uh, injured. I said, no, I jumped up, ran and jumped into the back of the 46, and uh, we took off and got out of there, and my rear seater was also rescued. We got back to uh, the Ford Hospital uh, just outside Da Nang, and uh, we were beaten up a little bit, but not bad, and we walked into the, the medevac tent and looked in there Marines with gunshot wounds, Marines bleeding, <clears throat> all in pretty bad shape. And I looked at my rear seater and, and the doc said, well, what can I do for you gentlemen? I said, get me a Jeep. That's all I need. <laughs> I, I don't need to see all of this. So we got in a Jeep and took off and found a ride back to our base at uh, Chulai. So <clears throat> after that mission, <laughs> we flew uh, several more missions, and as the war began to wear on, we began to have more and more missions up off the uh, off Hanoi. Uh, the Navy was pretty well strapped, and what we would do, we would fly best described as decoy missions. Just give a radar pattern to the bad guys so they would know that there were fighters in the area. And on one of those missions, <clears throat> as we were sitting off, off the coast, our radar observer, uh, Airborne, uh, gave us a call saying they had bogeys coming out of Hanoi and uh, they were heading in our direction. So <clears throat> we began to bank around and position ourselves, combat formation, and after about oh, two minutes, the bad guys did a split ass and returned uh, back to Hanoi. But those missions we were flying, an average of three to four hours, we would plug into a tanker going up and then we'd have to plug into a tanker coming back. And uh, all in all, it made for a very, very long day. Really enjoyed the fact that I was a squadron commander. I also realized that no black had ever commanded a squadron in the Navy or the Marine Corps before. So it was quite an honor, and the uh, squadron performed beautifully. There were no issues in terms of uh, race or frictions, but that was not the case for the other units in Vietnam. On my return to uh, the United States, I was assigned <coughs> to Headquarters Marine Corps and specifically to design and help programs that would improve uh, racial understanding within the Marine Corps. As such, I once again had to travel uh, with the Department of Defense teams, uh, not only just in the Far East, but also uh, in Europe, where there was the same kind of problems. The Army was uh, faced with guys who would be sent to Vietnam, do a tour, back to Germany for a year, then back to Nam for another tour. And these were some pretty hard guys, faced with some rather difficult decisions. On one of my uh, visits, I was asked to meet off base with a group of uh, 
a, a black militant group who wanted to explain to me one of their plans in terms of solution. And their plan was <coughs> to assassinate the European commander, General Polk. And I sat and I listened to this and I thought, these guys are kidding, but no, they were not kidding. And uh, <coughs> I said, okay, now all you have to do is decide who's gonna pull the trigger. So, if you, you know, who's, who's gonna put the bell on the cat? So they discussed it and so forth, and they finally backed off. But when I reported that back to my commander, there was a great deal of consternation because these were combat veterans, they were angry, they were mad, and it was the same philosophy. If you don't listen to your troops, you're gonna, you're gonna be in trouble. No one was listening to the troops, and they were becoming more and more and more upset. So I thought, okay, let's see what happens. And what happened was, in essence, that uh, a uh, task force was sent out from Department of Defense. They met with the individuals, not these specific guys, but the whole USAR-UR command, and finally came <clears throat> to understand that there was a need for a lot more understanding of uh, the racial differences and uh, why some of these troops were angry and the Army's policy of not giving troops enough time to settle down, relax, and be their own person. Pretty much what's happening in the military today. Uh, the troops are tired. Some of them have had five, six combat tours, and they're tired, and they're running out of steam, and that's becoming more and more obvious. Once I returned uh, from that particular assignment, I was then assigned to MAG-13 down at Cherry Point, North Carolina. And uh, <clears throat> I was assigned to uh, be an air group commander and uh, was introduced to the weirdest airplane I ever, ever flew. It was called the Harrier, a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. And uh, <clears throat> could also then fly uh, horizontally, the same as any other jet fighter. And uh, when I saw the airplane and uh, began to learn how to fly this weird machine, I, uh, I knew that this was gonna be a, a tough one, and it was. As I began to fly the airplane, <clears throat> uh, I have jokingly said many times, I stopped drinking Scotch whiskey. That airplane would make you think. It, it was an absolutely fantastic machine. And uh, I really learned to, to enjoy flying it. In fact, I, once on a cross country, I had my brother meet me in uh, Houston, Texas, where we had stopped to refuel. And my wingman and I did uh, vertical rolling uh, landings where you hover, half hover, half forward speed, but you touch down at about 30 knots. And my, my brother, who was outside the hangar waiting for us, when I got out of the cockpit, he said, what in the hell is that thing? <laughs> He, he had never seen one before, and in fact, the people at the tower wanted us to do it again, so <laughs> because it was it was such a, a a unique piece of machinery, and it is today. It's still in the Marine Corps inventory, and uh, quite rightly, it'll be phased out, I think, within the next two years with the F-35 coming on board. Um, I don't know if the uh, F-35 is going to be able to make it in time, because it is going through some... Uh, development problems. But the Marine Corps, as many of the other services, has a very aging fleet. Uh, I flew the F-18 in 1987, and it's still in the inventory. I flew the Harrier in the late 70s. It's still in the inventory. So the aircraft are getting old. Even though you refit, reboot them, there's only so much time you can put on that airframe. Because once they get old, you have metal fatigue, you have a bunch of other problems, and it's time to refit uh, the service. And not just the Marine Corps and the Navy, but uh, all services are having problems right now with uh, how do you refit the aircraft and regroup in terms of having uh, a ready viable force. My, <clears throat> my career ended at uh, 1988 at the Marine Corps Base Quantico. Uh, my uh, career had covered many, many different aspects, and not the least of which 
was the commanding general of the 1st Marine Air Wing stationed in Okinawa, Japan. I really enjoyed my tour. I really enjoyed uh, my flying career. And in fact, on more than one occasion, from my uh, command headquarters in uh, Okinawa, I had command scattered over about three different countries. I would get up in the morning, I'd fly down to uh, QB Point, visit with my troops there, have lunch, spend the night, the following morning, get up, fly to Atsugi, Japan, with a refuel en route, spend the day there, then the next day, take off, fly over to Korea, visit my troops there, and then fly back uh, to my home base. So the area of the Far East is not as, oh, uh, expansive as one would think. It's a very close environment. A lot of problems were beginning to surface, uh, not the least of which is the emergence of China as a major power. In fact, they just recently deployed their first uh, aircraft carrier to the Philippine area. So there's a lot of changes taking place uh, in that area. I remember when the Philippine, go the Philippine government requested that uh, uh, the military forces get out of, uh, get out of uh, Subic Bay. And of course we, we complied. And here recently, with uh, China making noises, it appears that uh, the Philippine government is inviting military forces back, back into that area. Uh, the Marines have expanded. We're now in, uh, of all places, Australia. And uh, that is to counter the Japanese government's resistance to uh, Marines deployed uh, in Okinawa. So Marines are looking at Guam and a bunch of other places where uh, we can serve and still be able uh, in a responsive sense. So I had a lot of fun. I uh, remember my, uh, my last days at Quantico, and <clears throat> not the least of which, uh, my retirement, which was extremely traumatic. Uh, one day you put on your uniform, three stars, you're up at 0600, you got about 100 things to do, and on the day after your retirement, you wake up at 0600 and you say, I don't have anything to do. <laughs> <laughs> very, very traumatic experience, but uh, a lot of fun. I really enjoyed, and uh, if I can respond to questions at this point. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> it's hot up here. Yeah, those lights, that's right. Okay, folks, we're ready for questions. Here. And uh, I can remember uh, hearing about the original AV-8 uh, Alpha, the original Harriers, being more of a test pilot type of program where they would really select pilots to get on an aircraft and, and that kept the, the casualty rate down. Later on, they sort of veered away and just made an operational squadron with the, with the uh, Bravo version. Could you talk more about how the transition from that original Harrier was? Mm -hmm. to, the, to the later models that maybe a little more yeah, Can you compare the, uh, the flying qualities of the AV-8A to the AV-8B when it had three-axis stabilization? Uh, the AV-8A uh, did not have, can you hear me okay? Yeah, the AV-8A did not have some of the more sophisticated uh, control devices that the B did. And the AV-8A, uh, you flew it every second. Uh, if you did not grab the airplane immediately to correct, it had what we call an accelerating departure. In other words, if you started to roll, if you didn't catch it right away, that roll rate would increase until you would finally flip. The AV-8B had what we called <clears throat> stability augmentation system, where you could literally take your hands off the airplane in the vertical hover, and the airplane would correct itself. So that was a big difference. Oh, one other difference also is that uh, the uh, AV-8A, weighed about 18,200 pounds with engine exhaust thrust at about 25,000 pounds, which would give you roughly in hand about 7,000 pounds of vertical lift. In later models, the engine developed more power, which then gave you more of an ability to lift vertically in terms of the load. 
Go ahead. Sir, did you ever apply for the astronaut corps? Did you ever apply for the astronaut corps or consider it? When the uh, astronauts first came out, I think every uh, military aviator uh, thought about it. But there were a couple of considerations that uh, were part of the requirement. One, you had to be a certain height. If you were above, I think, about five foot six, uh uh, you couldn't, you couldn't get in the program. And I knew of several fighter pilots who were considering having disc removal operations to shrink to that height. <laughs> What kind of aircraft were you flying in Vietnam? Uh, in Nam, I flew consistently and always in the uh, F-4 Phantom, the F-4B. Wow. By the way, the reason I'm doing this is to get the question on tape. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Is it true that the Marine Corps was the first to uh, experiment with vector maneuvering in flight? I, don't, I think it was the Brits. Yeah, actually, uh, the Marine Corps picked up aircraft from uh, from the Brits uh, early on. Uh, the then head of Marine Corps Aviation, uh, Major General, I'm sorry, Lieutenant General Thomas Miller, took a delegation over to uh, Britain to take a look at the aircraft and was very impressed and looked at the. Uh, possibility of it working with the Marine Corps, especially with our forward basing concept. Uh, all you needed was a dirt road or a dirt strip or just uh, about 100 square feet and you can land that airplane. So we were the first to use it. I think um, we're almost exclusively the only ones to use it now. So she, you know that she knows that you enjoyed flying, but you seem too calm to be a pilot. The, uh, and was that the reason they chose you to uh, be a negotiator in some of these uh, uh, tense situations? I may have pay a paraphrased that, not quite right. Uh, the reason they chose me to assess with some of these race relations issues is because I was black. As as far as being calm, I can tell, I, I, some of my old squadron mates will tell you something a whole bunch different. <laughs> Was that a question or a comment? Yes, right here. Could you hear that? Could you a little louder? When were you first interested in becoming a pilot? My first interest, I'd always wanted to be a pilot. I'd always built model airplanes, and I always had a love of flying. But uh, it was only when I discovered that blacks were being accepted into the Naval Aviation Cadet Program that I said, hey, maybe now's my chance. Go ahead. What do you say? <laughs> hey, we're a couple old guys down here. You really, you need to speak up. Okay, it was. Okay. Okay, so based upon the uh, resistance initially and as he progressed in his career and had combat experience and, and with other uh, African-American pilots, what their experience was and whether it got better, is that kind of the question? Yeah. 
Yeah. And whether war had anything to do with the camaraderie and that sort of thing, is that kind of, the, and that's I think the gist of it. You're looking at uh, two entirely different uh, scenarios with the uh, Tuskegee Airmen. You're looking at black squadrons with 20 pilots or so in each squadron, commanded by a uh, black who, by the way, is B.O. Davis Jr., who went on to become the first black uh, Air Force general. As far as the Marine Corps and the Navy, let's face it, I, when I went through flight training, uh, I was the first. The next black pilot came through a year after that. The next black pilot came through a year after that. So there was no grouping in the sense of a large number of black pilots. In fact, I think to this day, there are, I, I'm, I'm, take a guess at this, less than 12 black pilots in the Marine Corps. One of them, by the way, is General Charlie Bolden, who's the administrator of NASA. Yeah, okay, here, here. Any others? Yes. Because of his height? It's, it's the anthropometric, right? It's the waist to head versus leg, probably. Huh? He's, I don't, you're not that, you're long-legged, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, that's probably, I mean, the F-4 is a bigger, you got we went out of the F-4? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, you, you want to answer that question? <laughs> I think General Daly did a pretty good job of it. The F-4 was a very, very roomy and comfortable airplane, and you only had to um, be concerned about your uh, uh, helmet to uh, cockpit canopy touching, and you also uh, could lower your seat or adjust your seat any way that you wish to do so. The problem with the uh, early ejection seats, the Martin Baker seat, it gave you a pretty good bang. I think you... I heard something like 22 instantaneous G's. So as you sit there, let's say you're 100 pounds, when you fire that canopy, you're, you're weighing uh, 22 times that. So that's where I picked up all of my injuries, back, hip, knee, uh, the whole nine yards. Yeah, that's been, they've been modified to a rocket seat now, so you get a much gentler ride. And it gets you a lot higher, too. Yeah, go ahead. You're, were you being, were you a token African American, or were you were you being patronized, or were you? Do you think you were actually uh, a hero, and that they saw you as that? That you were taking a role on and, and making it work? Um, quite often, I've, I've heard uh, that. Yeah, I was I was a token, and that's the only reason I made journal, et cetera. I said, eh, okay, that's fine. I accept that. But uh, <laughs> the truth of the matter is very competitive, and uh, th there, there are no free tickets, especially the Marine Corps. Yeah, I, I was in the Marine Corps at the same time, and I can tell you, if he hadn't been the best, he wouldn't have made it, because they were trying to make sure he didn't when he started. So uh, this guy earned everything he ever got. Go ahead. You fly off any carriers? Yeah, and uh, as you go through flight school, maybe I didn't explain that well enough. In your basic, you're required to make six carrier landings. And then when you go to advanced, you're required to make uh, six carrier landings in your, uh, we were then flying the F6F Hellcat. As I commanded MAG-32 with the Harrier, uh, I also qualified uh, with, with uh, uh, carrier. Totally different approach. In uh, the props or the jets, you come in from behind, line up, and then hit the wire. In a Harrier, you fly up alongside the aircraft, slide over, and land vertically. With no landing aids. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Do the U.S. Uh, Harriers use the ski jump? No. Oh, oh, the, do the U.S. Uh, Harriers use the ski jump? The reason for that is our amphibious ships are top heavy and they, they couldn't take that additional structure. You can't ask a question, you're working. 
<laughs> what is it? Okay. Yeah, after you after you got out of the core, uh, did you, you have anything to keep you busy, like hobbies and like a fly, like an airplane and a boat and other things? <laughs> when I retired from the Marine Corps, I uh, took an assignment as vice president with the Dupont Corporation out of Wilmington, uh, um, Delaware, and uh, part of my functions with that company was to be charge of their uh, aviation department. And I say departments because they own then three companies. They own. Um, Conoco, and also Louisiana Phillips, so we were all over the world. I uh, flew my own aircraft up until about, mm, about three years ago, and uh, I gave it up. Eyes went, ears went, brain kicked in. <laughs> okay, we've got time for one more. Go ahead. That was the first Marine aircraft wing. Was that the question? Oh, yeah. oh. well, give him another one so he can answer this one. <laughs> okay, all right, yeah, go ahead. How many kids do you have? I don't have children, I have grown adults. <laughs> Some of whom are here tonight, Gail, Dana, I don't see, Gail's not here, Dana. There's Dana, Lindsay, Frank, Monique, where? There she is. So there are four out of five here. They're all adult, they're all working, and they don't ask daddy for money. <laughs> well, General Peterson, thanks a lot for a really a great evening. We appreciate your candor, and uh, we appreciate what you have contributed to your country. And uh, we look forward to uh, having you back again and also to watching what you're going to do next. <laughs> the, and one of the things that you're going to do next is to sign your book out in the lobby okay. uh, into, the jaws of the ti into the tiger's jaw. And uh, so if, uh, if you'll exit via the rear of the theater, uh, General Peterson will meet you down there at the visitor's desk. I want to once again thank General Electric for making this evening possible. Thank all of you for supporting this, and uh, we'll see you at our next event. Thanks very much. Good night.